Good afternoon, and thank you for joining me today uh, for our, our daily report about the COVID-19 pandemic here in Erie County. Before I begin on my report, I want to apologize because I misspoke yesterday when answering a question regarding emergency medical services and our first responders. Of course, I know that our EMT, EMTs are highly skilled, highly trained individuals, and they are more than just ambulance drivers. I had nothing but the utmost respect for our paramedics and for really all of our first responders. So if anyone was offended, I truly apologize for that. Today, we have three positive cases of COVID-19 in Erie County to report. Two of them are in their teens and one is in their 30s. All three have connections to known positives. This has us at a total of 68 positives and 1,416 negatives. Contact tracing by the Erie County Department of Health continues. The three new cases all reside in zone one and you can find that information on the cumulative case map by zone at eriecountypa.gov. We now have 39 recovered cases to date out of the 68 total. So that means we have 29 active cases today. Again, the best practice for all of us is to act like each person we come in contact with has COVID-19. No matter the number of reported cases, we know that the virus has spread in our community. So let's continue to do our part to slow the spread of COVID-19 in Erie County. The state numbers today are at 37,053 cases and the deaths are at 1,421. And this is an increase of 1,369 new cases recorded in the past 24 hours across the Commonwealth. Crawford County has 19 positive cases. McKean County has five. Warren County has one. Chautauqua County still has 28 cases and three deaths and Ashtabula has 80 cases and six deaths. Our environmental team received 46 complaints yesterday and they're following up on their calls and continue to make field visits to really educate and assist our businesses in being compliant. As we heard from the governor last night, the Northwest and North Central Pennsylvania regions are expected to be moved from the red status to the yellow status on May 8th, just a little over two weeks. The governor's team is currently working on a plan and we are working with them to understand what will and will not be reopened during this next phase. We do know that the number of cases a region has is one of the criteria to begin the incremental reopening. Right now, we are told that the regions with fewer than 50 cases per 100,000 residents over a 14-day period meet that criteria. Keep in mind that when more businesses are reopening, we must remain vigilant to social distancing hand hygiene, and universal masking. Masks have to be part of our wardrobe now. In addition, we continue to receive questions regarding, regarding thermometers and temperature taking. So just to clarify, temperature taking for all businesses is highly recommended, but not required. However, businesses who have had an exposure to COVID-19 must implement temperature screening. We want to express our appreciation for our businesses and residents who are really working so hard to comply with the guidelines set forth by the state and the Erie County Department of Health. If the number of cases in our region rise to 50 or more per 100,000 residents over that 14 day period, and we are back in the yellow, in the yellow region now and able to be reopened, the state will demand that our region go back to the red level of restrictions and businesses will be closed again. And of course, we all want to avoid that. So with that in mind, we are working on a plan with our partners to help our businesses meet the compliance and make this the safest reopening of our economy possible. We'll provide many more details as we receive them from the state 
about which specific sectors will be included. So please continue to tune in, to go to our website, to look for guidance, and know that we're here for you. Lastly, please stay home. Continue to physically distance yourself at least six feet from anyone who does not live in your home with you. Continue to wash your hands regularly for at least 20 seconds, as well as sanitize and disinfect your surfaces. And as I said, continue to wear a mask. If you need to leave your home for work, for shopping, or even a walk, please wear your mask. Your mask protects me, my mask protects you. You're encouraged to refer to guidance provided by the Pennsylvania Department of Health and the CDC, and guidance and much more information can be found under resources on the COVID-19 page at eriecountypa.gov. And again, if you need information or assistance from our enforcement team, go to eriecountypa.gov, call us at 451-6700, or email us at ecdhinfo at eriecountypa.gov. We would now like to welcome our healthcare partners to provide an overview of what they are experience, experiencing. And today we'll start with UPMC Hammett and Emily Shears. Emily? Hi everyone, good afternoon. Kathy, thank you for inviting us once again. Um, we find this very helpful to brief the Erie community. On behalf of the UPMC, I want everyone to know that our hospital and physician offices are the safest places. If a patient requires medical care, we are here for them. I'm pleased to tell you that across all UPMC facilities and within the communities we serve, we are seeing the same pattern. COVID-19 caseload has not reached the high levels that we were more and are more prepared for, and the level we're seeing remains at a low, consistent, and manageable amount. Staff and patients continue to be screened, patients are masked, and visitors are restricted. We have appropriate personal protective equipment, negative airflow rooms, and specific units dedicated for COVID-19 positive patients, as well as rapid testing for any patient that is hospitalized, which allows us to get those COVID-19 results within 45 to 60 minutes. Any patient that needs essential care can and will receive it safely from UPMC Hammett, whether that's through a video visit or in person. We are, of course, doing this all in accordance with guidance from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and their tiered framework for non-emergent, medically necessary essential care. Um, our primary care and specialty networks do continue to see 70% of our patients through virtual visits, and our collection centers continue to be a resource for collection of COVID-19 testing for Northwestern Pennsylvania. And overall, we've collected approximately 800 patients and continue to see a positivity rate of 3%. Again, thank you to everyone in the Erie community, the amount of support shown to our faculty, facility, and members of the community and our staff really means the world to us. Please know our number one priority is, again, to keep everyone safe in terms of our patients and our staff. And thank you. Thank you, Emily. And thank you for that really great report and for everything you're doing at UPMC Hammett. And now I'd like to invite Allegheny Health Network, St. Vincent's Hospital, uh, Dr. Wayne Jones to join us. Kathy, thank you so much for having me back. So I want to break from my traditional report. Um, we've talked about safety and, and collection specimens and so forth. And I believe everybody um, understands uh, how they can access our system and what we do. But let me talk a little bit about what St. Vincent is doing for the long-term sustainment phase of this pandemic. A little bit of insight for all of you. Uh, a couple of examples. So uh, we've obtained several hundred N100 MSA style masks. These are the heavy rubberized masks that cover your, your mouth and nose. And they're sterilizable, they're reusable. Um, we can use these over several months. It helps mitigate the N95 mask use. If, if you recall, N95 masks are those that are in really short supply across the country. So this bolsters our N95 mask uh, uh, stockpile but also creates a more sustainable use mask. Uh, Dick Sporting Goods, along with Allegheny Health Network, uh, just recently donated fanny packs. These are given to all our personnel who do direct uh, patient care. You open a fanny pack, what you'll find is a hand sanitizer, a surgical mask. You'll find a paper bag to store your surgical mask in and a face shield. Uh, also, AHN is made available to all their facilities uh, EMS fogger devices. These are used by EMS partners across the AHN 
to clean the back of their ambulance once they arrive a patient at our facilities. This helps them to reduce their cleaning time. It creates a sanitary environment both for the ambulance personnel and patients, and it mitigates disease transmission. So these are a few of our long-term um, safety solutions we put into place. Uh, I want to reiterate something from last time, and it's been talked about uh, on this phone call, is the deep concern I and many of us have uh, for the health of our community. We're finding patients are not seeking health care at this time. They're very worried about uh, being exposed to COVID, whether it's at the grocery store or at their physician office. Uh, we really take a lot of measures to make it a safe place for patients, whether you're going to your physician office or you're coming to the emergency department of St. Vincent. If you call ahead, we'll pre-screen you. If you arrive, we screen you on arrival. We'll divide you into different populations uh, so that uh, you uh, prevent any spread of disease, either from yourself or, or to yourself. So please, if you need health care, uh, seek it out. Uh, I think that the chance of getting COVID is much less than uh, succumbing to a disease that we could uh, we could help you overcome. So, Kathy, back to you, and thanks. Thank you, Dr. Jones, and uh, thanks for that report on uh, what you're doing going forward because it's obviously really important to our community. Uh, LECOM Health, Monsignor David Rabino. Good afternoon, Kathy. How are you? Um, our report from, uh, we thank you first for your leadership in this and the County Health Department. These are difficult times and we appreciate you inviting us to this weekly press conference, as well as leading us through these very uncharted waters. Relative to Mill Creek Community Hospital in Quarry, we continue to test. We've had about over a hundred tests. We see our, our PPE stable, our emergency room traffic is stable and we continue there to follow all the CDC and CMS guidelines relative to testing people as they come in, taking their temperature, masks, and restricting visitors for the safety of the staff, and more important, with the safety of the patients. The senior living facilities and our senior communities continue to follow all the CMS and CDC guidelines. One change that was regulated this week is that we will continue, we will start, I should say, making weekly calls that will go out to residents and their responsible parties informing them of the conditions of the facilities per the CMS and the CDC guidelines. These calls will be weekly or as needed as things come to pass. As my other colleagues, telemarketing has increased significantly, uh, telemarketing, telemedicine has increased significantly over the last few days with our MAE network. And our behavioral health psychiatrists and staff asked me to pass this on. They're seeing a very high volume of patients. People are worried about their jobs. They're worried about layoffs. They're worried about loved ones. They're worried about the unknown. And they remind our community that they're there for their help. But they specifically wanted me to say something about parents with children at home. Because I think that's a very difficult thing as I was informed. And their advice to parents with kids at home is that they should try as best they can to keep a routine with them. They've also said and asked me to remind our parents that there's no such thing as a perfect parent, that all parents are in a sense juggling how to do this with their children at home. The academics are tough. It's hard being a teacher if you're not a teacher. And they suggest not to stress so much over that, but to do the best you can to engage with your child, to remember to have fun with your child and your family. And most importantly, they say, in these high pressure situations of families at home with their kids, especially moms and dads, to take care of themselves, to take time for themselves, to care for them, but that's just as critical as caring for the little ones that they have in their charge. So that's it for Murray and Kathy. Thanks much for your time. Thank you, Monsignor Rubino. And um, thanks for that reminder, I think, for all of us and uh, particularly for our parents. As a mother of five, I've talked to my husband about how, wow, I can't imagine what this would have been like if my children were all still living at home. So I do really uh, appreciate you uh, addressing that. Uh, from our Veterans Administration Hospital, we have Doreen Summers with us today. Doreen, are you with us? Maybe Doreen's having some technical difficulties. Um, we'll see if we can uh, get Doreen on the line later, maybe. 
Um, anyway, I will uh, open it up to the media for questions now. So we will start today with Talk Erie. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate it. Um, uh, just following up on the reporting this morning in the Erie Times News about Twin Brook and the COVID-19 patients going there. Uh, where are the patients coming from to go to Twin Brook? So um, let me just start by saying that nursing homes and, and uh, long-term care facilities like that are under the jurisdiction of the state health department, and our county health department doesn't have any um, interface with them in terms of our public health work. But uh, we found out about this, um, uh, this uh, potential change at Twin Brook uh, just pretty much the way everyone else did. So we, uh, at this point, are reaching out to the corporation to try to gather more information to understand what the plan is. And so at this point, I don't have anything else to offer you except to, to uh, express that uh, I and my staff have concerns and uh, we want answers just as the community does um, on this issue. Uh, prior to anything uh, occurring uh, that's different than the way that, uh, has, that uh, long-term care facility is run at this time. But I do not have, we have not been able to have the kind of communication yet that we hope to have um, about these plans if they're going to go forward. The follow-up would be, would the patients at Twinbrook count against our 50 per 100,000 count? that the Secretary uh, Levine is looking at as far as opening us up to a yellow status? So that's obviously a great question because it would be a huge concern. But from what we would surmise, the way everything has gone all along is a person's status stays with the county that they live in. So we had a case here where we had uh, an individual um, pass away who was actually from another county and even another state and that number never factored into our Erie County numbers. And I would expect that the same would happen. So if a person was moved here uh, from, let's just say Crawford County, that that number would stay in Crawford County, not come to Erie County, and the same if they came from even somewhere much further away, uh, that it would actually stay in that county where they reside, where their permanent residence is. Mm -hmm. Jet TV. Yeah, hi, Kathy. It's Samir. Uh, I want to stick really fast with the Twin Brook news. I know you said you don't have that much uh, regarding it, but would you prefer, uh, I guess, those patients be transferred to, let's say, one of the hospitals, I guess, like Lee Calm, UPMC, or St. Vincent, rather than a facility like Twin Brook? What I would prefer is that we not move people around who have COVID-19 and positive. I think uh, it's, it's something we've talked about from the beginning, to have people stop traveling, to have people... Obviously, if you have uh, COVID-19, to stay in an isolation type situation, uh, if you've been exposed, to stay in a quarantine situation. And so moving people around really goes against anything that we've talked about here for five or six weeks. So that's what we would prefer. And then uh, just to follow up to that, so I was out there earlier today and I was speaking with uh, community members out there and they have a high concern having uh, COVID-19 patients obviously be transported there. I mean, if you've been out to the facility, it's in a residential area, it's pretty close in proximity to a lot of row houses in the area. So I guess, do you have any words of encouragement and advice for those uh, residents living in that area? So what I would say to those residents is, first of all, we are very concerned and we are really trying to find the information and, and then hopefully address our concerns that we would have as a county government health department uh, entity. Uh, but secondly, I would also, um, just remind everyone, whether you live in Lawrence Park, whether you live near Twinbrook, or whether wherever you live, COVID-19 is out in our community, and just use caution that every person you come in contact with could be a carrier for COVID-19. Um, I think, honestly, the people who are at least at risk of spreading COVID-19 to the community at large are people who are in a hospital or uh, a nursing home type situation because they don't, they aren't mobile. They're not out. They're not about in our community, and so we know that our biggest risk is probably to those 25% of people who are positive and have no idea that they are a carrier of COVID-19 and could be at the grocery store you just went to, or could be the neighbor that you are walking with if you're out walking with someone and you're not keeping a six-foot different distance and you're not wearing your mask. Those are the really big concerns. But I truly understand the concerns of the people 
in Lawrence Park and in that region. So again, we're, we're concerned also um, from a community level and we will be trying to address this. Erie Times News. Hi, Kathy, it's David. Um, and again, uh, follow up on Twinbrook. Is there anything, uh, any indication from the health department that there's a demand for an entire facility to, to treat COVID-19 patients, especially when we have LECOM with a wing of its facility that has been transformed into a COVID-19 um, place for, for long-term care residents? We see no demand from Erie County or from Erie County residents. And then uh, follow up on a, on a different thing, just kind of a housekeeping thing. When you gave the numbers of cases, um, you have the new cases, three total cases, 68. I'm then assuming that includes the three probable cases that you talked about yesterday? Yes, uh, and now we're basically just gonna fold it all in as once because probable cases really are cases. They just haven't had that lab confirmed, but um, you know that, that probable case is, uh, we've had our epidemiologist team talking to those people, um, you know, we really truly believe they are a positive case. They just have not been tested. So we're just going to lump them all together and just give a, uh, a full number of these are our cases in Erie County. And then we're following through on the recovery from those people too. So when they are, you know, so many days past, uh, three days, 72 hours past symptoms, they would also be recovered. So going forward, we won't be splitting them between confirmed cases and probable cases. You're no, to we're not cases. going to do that any longer because we think it's actually more confusing. We think that the full number just honestly gives a better representation of where we are in our community and how many cases we're really dealing with. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Erie News Now. Hi, good afternoon. A question for you regarding the governor's plan, although um, obviously uh, you've been pushing for a while, hoping that, that our area could be one of those first to reopen. Uh, your reaction to hearing last night that we were indeed probably, fingers crossed, going to be one of those areas that would be the first to reopen. And then to what extent have you already been in communication with the state trying to uh, nail down more specific details on what that will entail uh, two weeks and one day from now? Yes, so we obviously believe that we have proven ourselves in this region. Um, we've done an excellent job over the last five weeks of really um, mitigating the spread of COVID-19. The community has worked really well with us to be our partners and, and following the guidance uh, put out by us and put out by the state and really put out by the federal government also. And so um, we want to get our economy back up and rolling but I think it's really important to understand that we will not be just turning a switch, that this will be a gradual reopening. This will be done very methodically. Um, businesses will be given strong um, guidance on what this looks like for them in their particular sector. And that's one thing we're working with the state on now is um, we know there's some general guidance that every business needs to look at, but I think there are some sector level guidance that we want the state to help us with and then they could use that hopefully uniformly over the whole commonwealth so those are the kind of things that we are doing and we are having i've had a number of conversations already today of course this just was uh, brought forward last evening and uh, we're not even 24 hours into the governor making the announcement but we continue to try to get to the specifics of what this looks like and um, you know i've always said we're that kind of community that's big enough yet we're small enough that I think we can show how this can be done in a very responsible way and help to guide other parts of the Commonwealth on this. If I may follow up on that, mm -hmm. received a couple of calls today from people who, uh, to use their words, were fearful of being, uh, as they put it, um, guinea pigs, where, uh, mm -hmm. you know, where, yes, we get to reopen before everybody else, but we're also the people that everybody are watching to see what's happening. So what would you say to those people who have a little bit of concern about being among the first places to reopen? Well, I guess I would say, first of all, that we are all very cautious, uh, meaning we in, in the health department and county government, um, even our business sector that I've talked to, everyone knows that we have to be very cautious and we have to do this the right way. And we're gonna still, even though the stay at home order may be lifted, I'm still gonna be, on here encouraging everyone to stay home as much as possible and to still limit their time away from their home. So those kind of things are not going away. Universal masking is gonna be with us for many, many months. Um, all of those type of guidance things, washing your hands, et cetera, et cetera, that we've put in place, 
need to stay as part of our daily and hourly habits. So um, I just want to reassure people that we are always, our first concern is always the life, the safety, the health of our residents. And so we will only do what we believe is applicable and um, can keep us in a safe place. And so uh, one of the things, one of the advantages we have here, and, and really we have it almost over any other county that's gonna be opened up first, is we have a health department. We have a health department who's got staff that is very trained in our, on our environmental side to work with our businesses. We've got the contact tracing, which none of these other counties within these two regions that they're talking about opening have. And so we feel that we are really best placed for this type of work. And when you look at the threshold of 50 cases per 100,000 over a 14 day period, we have 68 cases and then we have about 278,000 people in Erie County and that's over, over a five week period. So we really are, we've really placed ourselves in a good position. But COVID-19 is out there, make no mistake and that virus is looking for its next host. And you don't wanna be that person who's the next host for this virus. So even once we open up, we all have to be very, very cautious. And you know, I'll go back to even some things I said. I don't think we're gonna be having large gatherings this summer. I don't foresee that happening. Um, you know, we're not gonna, it's not gonna be the same summer with all of our concerts and all of our festivals and all of our very, very big gatherings. You know, it was just announced that the uh, Friends of the Library are not gonna have their great American book sale and, and it'll be on and on and on. A lot of those events that we've all come to love and know and are part of the fabric of our community are not going to happen. But that's because we all care about each other and we want people to be safe and we don't want that virus to find its next toast. So we're gonna be cautious. And if you are not comfortable going out, then don't go out. And um, if you're not comfortable and you get into a situation and you think there's too many people, it doesn't seem safe for you, turn around and go home. I recommend that anytime. Uh, you know, your safety is, is your responsibility first and you know how to, where you feel safe and where you don't. But we're gonna try to make sure that our community as a whole is safe. Talk Erie. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, just to kind of follow up on what you were just saying there, I have a question here. Well, why do we have to wait for the two weeks if we've been all along qualified as a yellow uh, uh, type of region here? Uh, and, and, and even with uh, Dr. Uh, Levine's uh, additional uh, metrics of testing and hospital beds and contract tracing, and, and I don't know about the modeling from uh, Carnegie Mellon, but it seems like we've already hit all those metrics. Why wait till May 8th? Well, that's what the state has decided and we're under the you know, guidance of the state and when it came to business closures, that all came from the state. So it's up to the state to actually tell us when we can reopen all those businesses. So I guess I'll start with that. We're gonna wait until the state allows it. But I think there is actually another big piece of this and I've sort of alluded to that, that um, our businesses are gonna need some guidance and we wanna help them to uh, have that guidance and to know how to do this safely and take some planning. I'll tell you, even in county government, we've been talking about, you know, what does this look like? And, and there's some things that in our physical structure within county government that we want to change. Um, some barriers between us uh, at a counter and the people that would come into county government, whether they're coming in for a license to carry, whether they're coming in to pay their taxes, whether they're coming in to do something with our assessment office, whether they're coming in for a marriage license. You know, there's a lot of that happening even within county government and a lot of other business businesses need to look at their physical structure and then make sure that you can get your supplies in. Can you get masks for everybody, those who work for you? And if people are coming to your place of business and they don't have them yet, um, can you get a, a, a thermometer if you want to have one? We wanted to have them in county government, so we do have them now. And so, you know, what do businesses need? What do they need to do for their specific business activity? And so this gives everyone some time to be ready for uh, March 8th. Now, March 1st is construction, and that's only a week from tomorrow, and construction gets to uh, restart. And so that's the first group we gotta help, is figure out how construction does this and does it safely. 
Jet TV? Just a quick follow-up. Okay, sure. I'm sure, Joel. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just, just uh, on the on the statement that you made about you don't think there will be the festivals and, and the events that we like, along with those festivals are very important fundraising opportunities for places like St. Paul's and the Greek Orthodox Church. And and uh, we, we, we've received a word from the American Heart Association that all these events that they're missing right now is, is really – uh, making an impact on their finances. Any thoughts of what those folks should do? It's going to be very hard for our nonprofits and um, our faith communities and many, many others that, you know, I think we just got through Lent and many of our Christian churches depend on fish fries for um, fundraising every year and they weren't able to do those. So we know how badly this is hitting those organizations. And I guess I just ask people to think about if you have the means, if you are still working, if you have the ability to support all those great places that you just mentioned and so, so, so many more, um, think, about, think about them and support them as you go forward. Um, you know, I spoke last week about WQLN, whose studios open up for me every single day so I can do this type of work, uh, not having their fun drive and, and supporting them. And, and so think about where you go in the summer. Think about those organizations you support. They're going to have to get clever and figure out new ways to raise money too. And I know many of them already are trying to figure that out. And uh, you know, I would love it if, um, let's just say the Greek church would have takeout of some of the wonderful food that I love to go there and eat. And I would certainly go and support them and, and get some takeout from that organization if they decide not to have their festival. So again, uh, it's a new world. It's a new world we're living in right now. And coronavirus, the COVID-19 is real and it's still, we still don't have a vaccine, we still don't have a cure, we still don't have great ways to treat it. Um, we treat the symptoms, but treating the disease itself is difficult. So uh, we've got to do all of these things, and it's, it's, it's not easy, and it's not gonna be easy for these organizations. Jet TV? Yeah, can, uh, one second. Uh, so I, I did wanna backtrack a little bit back to the Twinbrook, just to clarify, so uh, Secretary of Health, Dr. Rachel Levine, said people in nursing homes that have COVID would count against the county when considering moving from a red to a yellow status. Mm -hmm. So just to clarify, these patients, no matter what, would still uh, be considered a different county if they do come here? So again, we haven't had any conversations with Twinbrook or their corporate headquarters, um, and we haven't actually had conversations with the state about this. So we're assuming that uh, somebody who typically lives, let's just say in Allegheny County and would get moved to potentially this facility in Erie County for some reason that this corporation is deciding, um, we're assuming that they would not stay here forever, that they would be here for a period of time till they um, recovered and then they would go back to Allegheny and we're assuming that they would stay as an Allegheny number but we have to get confirmation on all of this. This is very, very new information, not even 24 hours, and um, it's not easy to always get the information as quickly as we'd all like to get it, but we're, we're striving to do that. All right, and then I have a question for the healthcare providers, if they're still on the line. So I wanted to circle back to my question yesterday regarding uh, the Rite Aid self-testing uh, with the swabs and uh, get their thoughts and opinion on that. Would any of our health care providers like to take that on? Uh, this is uh, Wayne Jones. I really don't have any information on their, their testing, so I really can't comment. Sorry. Would anyone else like to comment gonna, on that? Yeah, I was just going to comment the same. Um, I don't have any details on how that um, test has been validated, what the test actually um, is being run on and where that's being conducted. So no, no other comment. I would agree with Father Rabino. Have... I'd agree with oh. my colleagues from St. Vincent and from Allegheny Health. Samir, did you have a follow-up to that? Yeah, I have a follow-up. And uh, do you guys have any cases, Erie County uh, positive cases of COVID-19 uh, in your hospitals currently? I can comment for the UPMC Northern region, the six hospitals from Chautauqua down to um, Horizon. We do have six patients in um, amongst the six UPMC hospitals. 
In the St. Vincent, we also care for uh, patients suffering from COVID. I am not absolutely sure, but to the best of my knowledge, we do not. Thank you. Erie Times News. Um, yes, Kathy. Um, talking about going from, from red to yellow, I want to um, get your thoughts specifically on the Mill Creek Mall. Governor Wolf commented on, on that, was posed a question, I think, by one of my colleagues on that earlier today. And he expressed some concern about the, the travel that people might have going to the mall from, from Buffalo and Cleveland. I um, want to get your thoughts on that. Um, are, are you concerned especially about destination shopping if, if the mall opens up? Well, obviously, we know that Erie County is a, a great place to shop, and many of our neighboring um, states' uh, residents come here to do that, um, as well as people from Crawford, Warren, and, and places to the south in Pennsylvania. And of course, that movement back and forth across state lines has always been a concern, especially um, if they come from great lengths. I mean, we also know we have a number of people who do go back and forth to work every day. That's not much of a concern. It's really those people who've been in other communities and come here. So it is a concern. And uh, again, we don't have enough detail to know what exactly the governor and the DCED are going to allow in terms of opening. But um, we will wait for guidance from them. Um, I have much less of a concern, you know, for one of our, maybe our local uh, stores, it's in a plaza type situation and it's more frequented by our local uh, residents, but any store that opens, especially if they're selling something that's not taxed here and is taxed somewhere else, uh, could be um, a draw for people to go there. Just like golfing could be a draw for people from here to go over to those states right now as golfing is currently closed. So anytime that that happens, and we live so close to two other states, uh, that is more of an issue for us here in Erie County than it is for somebody, say, down in uh, Venango or uh, out in Clearfield County. So uh, those are the kind of things that we have to navigate through, um, and we will try to get a better direction from the state on that. And then another certain aspect that I wanted to get your thoughts on was um, dental offices and other medical offices that haven't been open during this, um, podiatry, other, other non-emergency medical offices. Have you heard anything about whether this will, they will be allowed to reopen as part of this uh, going from, from red to yellow? I have not heard about that yet. We don't have any specifics on which businesses will be allowed to open and which ones will not be, except for a very general guideline that came from the state yesterday. Erie News Now. Hi, a question for our healthcare providers. Uh, healthcare uh, and healthcare workers all over the country have said that they expect some sort of a spike when we start to reopen a little bit more. And so, to what extent, um, A, do you agree with that assessment that we likely will see a little bit of a spike in cases as we slightly loosen restrictions? And then, B, uh, how have you been kind of preparing for that, if at all? Um, trying to prepare for moving to this yellow phase where there's a little bit more interaction between people. Yeah, I'm happy to start with that. Um, we are more than well prepared. We have not had anywhere close to the surge that we're prepared for. So if there is some small um, increase in community spread, I would say that we are um, able and willing to take care of any of those patients um, and have the ability to do so. Father Rubino from LECOM, uh, I agree with Emily. We have sufficient supplies to handle it now. I think we have to be mindful, though, of the fall and that we have to maintain our supplies and maintain our staff. So if we see a spike of flu and COVID in the fall, we're capable of dealing with it. We are, but I think we have to be mindful and keep our eyes on it just to be sure. This is Wayne Jones at St. Vincent. Uh, we have been preparing uh, since early February uh, for all of this, receiving reports out of China, then, of course, early arrivals here in the United States. With canceling uh, elective surgeries and realigning personnel, we have really been able to uh, create new care environments, which speak much more to the COVID uh, uh, type of patient, uh, whether it's negative airflow, more intensive care units, more ventilators. So we are really prepared for this. I don't know if we'll see the surge that has been predicted, I think we have mitigated much of it uh, early on within the county. I suspect we'll continue mitigation uh, as we start to open up. Uh, 
So we will see more uh, uh, people suffer from COVID, though I suspect uh, every healthcare facility in town has had so much time to prepare now that I think we'll be ready for it. Gotcha. So just to clarify there, you think we will see a little bit of a spike in cases, but you think you're well equipped to, to take care of it? I think it's inevitable you're going to see uh, more cases once we allow the general public to get out and interact. Uh, I believe it will not be as severe as it was seen across the nation, but I believe we'll see a spike. I think Dr. Jones is absolutely correct. We're going to see some type of increase, but I think all the facilities in town are wonderfully prepared. That's a bad choice of words, but are prepared indeed to deal with what's going to come down the road. Well, thank, thank you all. Um, I think that one of the things we always wanted to do in the beginning was to um, really mitigate the spread to give our health care providers uh, who are with us today to get their facilities the opportunity and the time to really be prepared. And we did very, very well with that here in Erie County. So thank you. So last uh, real quick round of questions. Talk, Erie, do you have any final question? Just very quickly to uh, Emily Shears from UPMC. Dr. Yealy was talking about that UPMC is now going to asymptomatic testing. Can you explain what that test is? It's kind of like a follow-up from last week. Uh, what that test is and how many tests uh, have you already done here in the Erie region? So um, first I'll, I'll address your, the latter part. We've done 800, uh, around 800 collections for COVID testing um, in the area. As far as what Dr. Yealy was talking about, um, care and conditions that have been previously delayed, um, you can imagine when we um, stopped scheduling some surgeries are now gonna be what we would deem essential care. So as we start to roll um, out some of those essential cases and the necessity um, for the patients, we're gonna look at the risk of not doing the interventions. We're gonna evaluate um, if we need to do the intervention because it's medically necessary would we test those patients that are not symptomatic? And that's what Dr. Yilly was talking about. So yes, as a system, we have plans to roll that out. Um, we are working on those right now. We are staying in alignment with CMS, Medicare, Medicaid, and the state guidance with that as we, um, again, provide medically needed care. Um, if a patient meets criteria or um, has a high-risk procedure, we would be testing them even without symptoms to know that um, when we put them in the hospital, we are not increasing the risk to staff or other patients. Great. Jet TV, do you have any final question? Samir, are you there? Okay, yeah, just one last question. Sorry, I hit the wrong button on the phone. Uh, the Northeast Fire Department uh, reached out, one of their chiefs did, regarding the Cherry Festival. So a few weeks back, of course, we, uh, or uh, last weekend or so, we had that uh, farm show gathering, the auction that took place. So uh, is there a way for these smaller organizations who plan on still hosting events to kind of meet with the health department to kind of seek out guidelines to host these, or would the health department just prefer to ax these type of events uh, moving forward for the rest of the year? So in the yellow um, range, when we open up, we're gonna be in the yellow zone, I guess you call it. Um, there are no gatherings more than 25 people. And so that would be um, all festivals, of course, or have more than 25 people. Uh, the auction was a very different event. They did get a waiver from the state and that was because they were selling farm equipment, which has to do with a life-sustaining business of, um, you know, farming, uh, per, uh, growing our food. So uh, that's why that happened. And I don't expect that as long as we're in this yellow uh, zone that we will be having, we will be allowing any gatherings of more than 25 people. So that unless we got to the green zone and I don't even know when that would be and what that would look like so I can't really address that otherwise. Erie Times News, do you have any final question? Um, yes, Kathy, on the state um, Department of Health website there was a, a third listed case for uh, nursing homes, this one involving an employee. Mm -hmm. um, wanted to, to see what you knew about that, if that was in connection to any of the, any of the three cases at the same facility and is there anything you can share about the, the employee that has been found to have COVID-19? So a couple of days when you asked me about the two, I 
thought that one was an employee, but then found out that actually that was two residents. So we had already knowledge of one employee, and that's all the information I can give you. But there is no outbreak at any facility, um, so I do want to ally people's fears in that regard. Erie News Now. Are they three different facilities that the three people are at? I believe that they are, actually. But it could be two. I, I have to confirm on that. Erie News Now. Hi, a final question with you, and I'd like to stick with uh, nursing facilities and senior living facilities. Uh, we're, you know, well into a month here of, of people there basically being stuck there, unfortunately. And so just what is your message to those watching right now as they, uh, you know, go through this, not being able to see visitors, not being able to see loved ones, and in those contained spaces where mercifully we haven't seen any outbreaks yet, and fingers crossed we don't, but just your message to those people watching uh, who are in that situation. So as we go into the next phase, the yellow phase, um, if you do read over the guidelines from the states, the, con the um, compliance issues at nursing homes will remain the same in terms of no visitors. And of course, as someone who has a loved one in a long-term care facility such as that, this is a very, very difficult time for all of us. And so one of the things that we've been able to do is the staff has the ability to let us do uh, FaceTime, you know, to Skype uh, with that, uh, with our loved one. And that's the best that we've been able to do also. Um, it's, it's very difficult. And I go back to maybe some of the things that uh, Monsignor Rubino said. Um, know that you are still a good son or daughter, a good grandchild, a good spouse, um, and we're all doing the best we can. Make sure that your facility hopefully has the ability for you to connect with them in some way where you can see each other and and converse and find new ways to show them how much you love and care about them. But it is a very, very difficult time. And if you're feeling anxious about that, if you're feeling um, depressed and, and, and lonely and all of those things that you, know, you may feel because uh, your detachment from that person that you love, don't forget that we do have our chat line, which is 814-273-7007, and that the state has a 24-7 line you can call at 855-284-2494. So there are people out there to talk to about this. And please feel free, too, to call those facilities. I think they probably all have social workers that you can reach out to and, uh, and speak to them even about your concerns. But it is a very difficult time. But we know that we're doing this for the wellness, the safety, the health of our loved ones. So we are doing actually the best thing for them in that regard. So with that, I want to thank our health uh, care professionals for joining me again on this Thursday, and I believe they'll be back with me next Thursday, and they always bring some great insight to our conversation here. And so I want to thank each one of them for being with us today, taking time out of their busy days, and for all the work that those first responders, those health care providers, those on the front lines who are really putting their life at risk every single day that they go out and do their work, thank you, thank you for what you're doing for our community. And thank you to our media, who continues to be our great partner in this effort against COVID-19. In the meantime, please stay home, please stay safe, please stay calm. Thank you.